In the summer of 1965, a violent attack against a local NAACP leader inspired the black residents of Natchez, Mississippi to use armed resistance to defend themselves against local white supremacists. They also organized an economic boycott that won some big concessions from the city. But less than two years later, this fight claimed the life of NAACP leader Warless Jackson Sr., a 36-year-old father of five. And 55 years later, his murder remains officially unsolved. Jackson's story, Natchez's fight for civil rights, and the largely unsuccessful federal push to solve cold-cased racist murders are all featured in the new frontline documentary, American Reckoning. Living in Natchez, everything was separated. Blacks was on one side, whites was on the other side. My mother and father tried to shield us from violence that was going on. A lot of violence was going on at that particular time. Southwest Mississippi, Natchez and Concordia Parish in the 1960s were this sort of like this frontier region where people still lived by vigilantism and it had never been challenged. You had a huge Klan population in this area. And that's the way things were. They were very quick to extreme violence. They felt very comfortable slaughtering people and knowing they could get away with it. The film's co-directors and producers, Yoruba Richin and Brad Lichtenstein, join me now. Thank you both for being here. The film is incredibly powerful, and I'm happy I get a chance to ask you some questions about it. Yoruba, let me start with you. How does what happened in Natchez in the 1960s shift the narrative or complicate the narrative that we've become accustomed to about the way the civil rights movement worked. Yeah, thank you for, for having us. Um, I think what's so fascinating about this story is how uh, the struggle, the black freedom struggle that took place in Natchez during this time uh, involved a, uh, first off, we tell the story of the foot soldiers of the movement and Warless was, was one of them, um, people that we don't normally hear about uh, uh, who were on the ground working for change. And that's one way it complicates the narrative. Uh, these struggles were happening all over the country, all over the South. Um, and, you know, we get to tell the story of, of one, one man. Uh, but it also complicates the narrative because the Warless worked with an organization called the Deacons for Defense, which was an armed uh, black resistance group that uh, self-defense group that protected the community from uh, the white terrorism, the Klan terrorism that was happening at the time. And they did not adhere to the uh, to the strategy of, you know, uh, don't fight back. They had to fight back in order to survive and uh, use, you know, armed resistance to do that. And they also enforced a boycott that the uh, black citizens of Natchez had started against the white community to make demands for to make demand for changes. And the deacons enforced that boycott and it was very successful. Um, and they won, they won uh, their demands and their boycott was actually modeled in other places across uh, the state. They, if I recall correctly, got everything they wanted. After initially being rebuffed, the boycott worked. And then we move on to the murder of Warless Jackson. Brad, uh, one of the big questions posed by the film for me was whether this federal push to investigate cold case racist murders, more than 100 of them, that started back in the late 2000s, whether that push was worth it, or if it wasn't worth it, whether it may even have done more harm than good. Where do you come down on that? <laughs> Um, well, uh, I'm not sure where I come down exactly, but uh, I think you're right. You know, the cold case initiative was pushed by John Lewis uh, when he was in Congress, the late Congressman John Lewis, who was really actually the, um, the uh, motivator behind this film in the first place. It came out of a conversation with him. And, you know, the intention, as Mr. Lewis would say, was that if uh, re-examining these cases could even just surface one person who had not until that time spoken, then you know that would have been worth it. But on the other hand, as you see in the film, um, the, the fact that there was so much attention, uh, especially in 2008 when these cases were announced um, as part of the Emmett Till Act, it, uh, it re-traumatizes some people as well. And that's very difficult. Um, and then, you know, where we sit now, where there have been no indictments uh, uh, as a result of, of any of the re-examinations thus far. And there's not a lot of hope that there will because 
Cold cases are hard. It's been a long time. A lot of the perpetrators are dead. The perpetrator in Willis Jackson's case is dead. Uh, so, you know, I think you raise a lot of good issues. Um, just one note, you know, when uh, Congressman Lewis introduced this legislation, he understood what was politically viable at that time. And what he really wanted to do was to have a truth and reconciliation process mm. in this country, uh, similar to South Africa, and to open the door to a conversation about reparations, which, you know, in 2008 uh, was, well, my colleague Yoruba says fringe. It was fringe at the yeah. time. Uh, today, we're actually having that conversation. We hope this film actually contributes to that. I'm really glad that you mentioned that. Thank you for that. Yoruba, one of the things that made this film so riveting for me was the footage that you were able to use of everyday life that, that gave a real sense of what it might have felt like in Natchez in the mid-60s. Let's show a little bit, about 30 seconds of that, and the narration here is from Wallace Jackson, Jr. This is a close-knit community here in Natchez. As a kid, family life with me and my sisters, the girls were kind of talkative and whatnot, and uh, I could take so much, but I want to get out and ride around the street on my bicycle and see what's going on around town. We had horses, we had cows, we had goats. You know, of course, when we killed a hog or something like that, everybody in the community got food, you know what I mean? And we shared like that out here. Yoruba, how were you able to find footage this, this detailed and evocative? Because I haven't seen this sort of thing before. Yeah, when I first saw this footage, I was uh, pretty amazed. Um, and Brad is actually the one who found that Warless's story, that this story was in the uh, film Black Natchez uh, and subsequent outtakes of the, uh, that, that the filmmakers did after Warless's funeral. Brad, do you want to say how you found out about this footage? Sure, sure. Um, you know, when, we when I first went down to Natchez, people in the community were telling me about this movie, Black Natchez, that I had to see. It was made by filmmakers Ed Pincus and David Newman, who are cinema verite, character-driven storytellers, much like uh, Yoruba and I in a lot of the films we've made. And so they filmed Black Natchez in a way that, uh, as you point out, is like so rich because it's so intimate. And they really camped out in the community. They spent 10 weeks there for Black Natchez, and we used lots and lots of outtakes. We only used about four minutes from the actual movie. And then um, shortly after Willis Jackson was murdered, um, Ed Pincus returned to Natchez and filmed for a number of days. And so that footage had actually never been seen by anybody until this film came out. It's mesmerizing to watch. And you have some comparable footage that's very troubling to watch of white Klan members and their families just kind of hanging out, having a good time, enjoying what they're doing, which is pretty chilling. Uh, closing question for you. Yoruba. Toward the end of the film, we hear from Deborah Jackson Sylvester and Warless Jackson Jr. about the impact that their father's murder had on the course of their lives. Let's take a look. I actually had a hatred for white people for a long time. It's like I blame every white person that I came in contact with. It took my life down a different avenue. It's been real hard. But uh, you move on, you persevere. Yoruba, one of the, maybe the biggest question posed by the film is what a just American reckoning with our legacy of racism would look like. Do you have thoughts on what a, an effective, genuine, meaningful reckoning would be? Yeah, I do. And I think it uh, begs the question, begs us to look at reparations and uh, to start to repair the harm. That's what reparations is for, uh, the meaning of it, to repair the harm that was done to these families. And this is very actionable, and it was not a long time ago. Um, and so in addition to financial reparations, what are services that can be uh, given to these families who are still dealing with this trauma every day? Um, and so that's that's what I think uh, could be a, a start. And the recon truth and reconciliation, where we have people come forward to tell their stories so these families are not left in the dark. Did you have a sense when you were talking with these families, if there were to be a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, do you think they'd want to be uh, a part of that, specifically Warless Jackson, uh, his family? 
I think they would. I think they would. They want the story to, to get out. Um, they are, um, you know, very uh, pleased that this story is airing um, and that their father's legacy is being honored. All right. Yoruba Richen and Brad Lichtenstein, thank you both for talking this through. The film's terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you.